All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome again for those who didn't hear me the first time. Uh, uh, this is the Dr. Knuckles we do every January where we focus on some innovation that stood out in the previous year's annual survey of programs. So before we get started in that, uh, we'd like to timestamp these Dr. Knuckles because we make them available on demand. So we're recording this on January 26, 2024. The reason we timestamp these is because, especially if we start discussing items of compliance in the Q&A, compliance can change up to twice a year. And we are preparing uh, right now for our next review committee meeting, so there's a lot of compliance discussions at that time. So if you're watching this down the road and we do start talking about standard compliance, um, we encourage you to visit knackles.org to get the most updated documents that comp uh, contain compliance or touch base with staff. Today's presentation team is our Vice President of the Board of Directors, Karen Brown, um, the CEO, Marissa James, and myself, Mark Spence. So we are talking about innovation today. And before I hand it off, I just wanted to make a blanket statement is that we started, we created this innovation question a few years ago, partially because of this presentation we had in mind, partially because we wanted to gather information from Chia. And ever since we did that, we've received overwhelming responses of all the different ways, both quote unquote, large and small that programs are innovating. Um, and if we would try to capture and comment on everything interesting, this would probably be a year long series of Dr. Knuckles. So if something that you offered didn't make the final cut or something of that, um, don't take it as a slight in any means. It may have been something we focused on the years previously. It may have been something that for some reason we just didn't get to because we tried to address themes. So um, we just hope that everybody focuses on maybe some inspiration on how to move forward um, with the presentation we put together. So with that, I will hand it over to Marissa. Hello there, delighted to be here with everyone. I love this Dr. Knackles session. Innovation is threaded into everything that we do here at Knackles. And so I just love seeing the creativity of our program directors and how they figure out new and unique ways to improve their programs, engage their students, involve their faculty. It just, just gives me so much joy. Uh, Mark and I looked through all 600 of them, um, the responses that we've received. Um, and so it's just, I just love looking at it. And today I have my good friend and vice president of our board of directors here, Karen Brown. And we are very excited to showcase some of the unique ideas that you all shared with us in the annual survey. And so, um, yeah, that's, I think that's my big intro. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, that we've got a lot of diversity um, for the different methods. Um, and I guess I miss, I guess I did screw that up. We can go back one. <laughs> um, sorry, I have to give this over to Karen to talk about this slide. <laughs> I'm just too excited. Well, thank you, Marissa, and, and I'm happy to be here today too, and and to acknowledge all the the great um, feedback we receive from programs um, in what they're doing for innovation. And you know, it was there was so much, and the one thing that stood out um, to me too was the diversity of the programs that responded. Not only did we have our MLS and MLT program directors, we had HT program directors, DCLS program directors, phlebotomy program directors. So across the board with all of our programs really um, provided so many um, good ideas and willing to share with what they were doing. And this slide just um, points out a few of the um, um, areas that we saw and particularly, you know, with delivery methods for our programs and uh, the other thing that stood out, I think, was despite all the challenges, programs are still being able to add new clinical affiliates, and that's really um, important and, and was really a, a little bit surprising to me um, that we saw that. But yet we saw ways in which programs were also trying to um, not really replace clinical affiliates, but and we'll mention this a little bit later as we go forth, but simulation labs are still very much out there um, trying to um, help ease the burden with, you know, the clinical affiliates. And there was a lot of uh, innovation that was spurred on by employers of our program graduates. And so that's good to see. 
and um, so we'll we'll move forward. I think now, um, Mark, and and just talk about some specifics. So Marissa, yeah, yeah. so we've got um, lots of uh, programs did uh, participated in scholarships and grants, and um, just being able to find that time is is really helpful um, to both the students and the programs themselves. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to add there, Karen. Well, just a, a couple things that stood out to me when we um, pulled out the theme of scholarships and grants that programs were working with their states, um, several programs working with states and initiatives that were going on in their own states to um, try to recruit students into not just laboratory professions, but to healthcare professions across the board. But but laboratory uh, or programs, uh, medical laboratory programs were trying to um, um, work with their states in these programs. So that stood out to me. We also saw that there were um, a variety of programs and not just with um, medical laboratory scientists and medical laboratory technicians, but also phlebotomy, um, looking for ways to increase um, uh, working with their employers in the states or in their clinical affiliates. A um, lot of individual programs looking to Perkins grants, for instance, to help um, fund some of their um, initiatives within their programs. And lots of, it seemed to me, there was corporate sponsorships also that programs were able to secure and help to provide scholarships to um, students. And some of these also required that you know the student commit to a, a working a time period to work at a particular laboratory. But these are still very. Um, I was just impressed by all of the the um, abilities of our programs out there to seek um, um, state support and corporate support within their areas. So that was something that I thought was really pretty cool. Yeah, so the next little bit here is um, cultural sensitivity and well-being for our students. And um, so I think Karen is gonna, just gonna kind of tell us some of the different things that our programs are doing to, to help their, their students, um, especially with you know their mental fitness. Well, and this was another area that was very, very um, important to see and very uh, good, I think, and a lot of programs are aware of this. And I think thinking about the mental health of our students was something that was driving a lot of this. And um, there were so many uh, innovations that came under this area, um, ways in which programs were trying to give students time off, um, and assist them in uh, in their own well-being, and to uh, to assist them in being resilient within their programs. And we saw that um, some of the programs had student advisory groups, for instance, to help support their students. We saw programs that um, tried to prepare students better to take exams and to um, have courses that put that considered the students' learning style into the curriculum and try to expand how they would um, um, tr help students but with their own particular learning style in with the programs. And I think all of this goes beyond, you know, traditional teaching methods too. Just looking for ways to have the curriculum designed to um, provide creativity and empathy and sensitivity for students and to look um, at all kinds of ways to support students just beyond you know the the what we would consider a traditional academic way to support students and so this was something that stood out i think in um in the innovations that were shared yeah there and the, one... the go the ahead color, the color vision glasses was right. really cool too uh, to see to see that because i know those can be kind of expensive but to to get those um for our students is, was really was really neat and that was something that I thought was cool as well. And I wasn't really aware of, mm -hmm. um, you know, access like that. So that's mm -hmm. that's really important uh, in laboratory sciences, I think, to have that availability for students. So, yeah. All 
right. So our next little uh, theme is is progression and uh, pathways. So these are just different um, clinical schedules, maybe some different types of rotations um, that have uh, checklists and accelerated pathways um, for even people who already have bachelor's degrees and, and you're trying to get them into the more um, laboratory specific programs. So I think Karen had a couple ideas or a couple things that popped up. Well, and just to comment a little bit more about the flexible clinical schedule, uh, I think um, this stood out to me because, um, you know, programs, I think, have been very good in offering part-time schedules from the didactic portion of the schedules. But to look at part-time clinical schedules, I think, was something that, that uh, caught my eye as I look through this, because that's something a little bit uh, more, um, well, I don't know if challenging is the word, but it takes a little more organization and management um, to have a flexible clinical schedule, but programs you know, are doing that. And so I think that's a really innovative approach too. And then um, with the um, clinical checklist, um, this was a, a new uh, way to help manage the experiences for students and help the students keep more control of their own rotations. So that was something, you know, putting a little more uh, responsibility on the students. So um, in this particular program, paired their MLS students with um, their clinical rotations so that they can, um, in their clinical rotation, so they could bounce ideas off of each other and work together. So that was very good. Um, another program um, uh, instituted an accelerated 11 month MLT program that specifically targeted um, post-baccalaureate um, um, science degree students. So that was um, trying to really increase not only the numbers in their programs, but to put people, more people out into the workforce. So uh, I thought that was really a good, a good innovation to, that was shared with us as well. Yeah. All right. The next one is kind of a fun one. It's the these yeah. outside the box, almost like you know some of the gamification that we talked about um, last year, and these are just so so cool to see. Um, you know, a tea time karaoke, three, two, one. Uh, Karen, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about uh, what these these uh, little ideas were. Well, I agree, Marissa. This was really fun to read. Um, and to, to hear about programs that are doing some of these um, outside of the box activities. So the tea time um, instituted by one program director was the idea that um, the, the students get together um, once a week and so and kind of spill the tea, if you will. <laughs> and, um, and they discuss the previous or the previous content in a lecture or the current content in a lecture. In a lecture. And the twist that this, this uh, particular program um, introduced here is that the students really have to come prepared um, to do this. And um, if they don't come prepared, then there's no session. So it really is up to the students to come prepared and willing to discuss and talk about it. And it's a little bit um, different from an actual tutoring session. They, they, the students are really contributing and, and driving um, this whole um, tea time. So I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, the karaoke um, is, is another really cool idea where um, some very familiar songs, the lyrics are changed in these familiar songs to help the students remember essential points from uh, a previous week's les uh, lesson, for instance. And so they would use that song as a, as a, a way to remember um, and I think that was really good. And then the three, two, one um, is also another innovative idea, I think, that this one program has introduced. And the students are asked to provide three things they learned from class mm -hmm. that day, two things that they liked about that particular class, or two facts that they remembered. And then what do they have that they still don't understand, or one question mm -hmm. that they have from this? And so then that information was all used to um, drive or inform the next class and, and move the whole uh, topic, if you will, as I understood it, move this whole topic forward. So that was another 
way that uh, programs are really trying to, and I think this goes back a little bit too to what I mentioned previously, that pro that programs are really trying to take into consideration each individual students as much as they can, yeah. their own learning styles, mm -hmm. and trying to find ways through gamification and through these mm -hmm. other ideas to because we don't all learn the same way. Mm -hmm. And so um, programs are really trying to find ways to help students learn and, in the best way that they can and what works for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's personalized education a little bit. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yep, having those little jingles in your head really does help, uh, help you remember things. <laughs> yep. All right, so interdisciplinary is the next little section, which is which is great that we started or starting to get more ideas in this area because um, if you are a Knuckles News subscriber, you may have seen that our new um, standards will have an interprofessional education component to them, and so it's really great to see some of these uh, programs who already kind of have that um, embedded into their program. So hopefully, you'll get a couple ideas. Um, when Karen shares a little bit more. Well, one program um, recognized in particular that their associate degree nursing students in their college really didn't have um, time in their curriculum to really delve into or to spend time with phlebotomy skills. And, you know, so many nurses have to have these skills for their functions and starting IVs and doing all kinds of things. And so this program was able to uh, and, and to me, it sounds like it, it's, you know, it's a win-win for both groups. So it's exposing the phlebotomy students to nurses and then nurses to phlebotomists, but then the phlebotomist yeah, students are being, you are, are training um, the nursing students, if you will, on the, the devices that are used in mm -hmm. blood collection and blood culture collection mm -hmm. and all the various aspects that are involved. So a really unique way to um, pair these two uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then um, other laboratory or other programs are um, using simulation, mm -hmm. um, interprofessional education that really works towards um, um, fulfilling a lot of the requirements within their program, mm -hmm. but within the whole health sciences department and reaching out. Um, and yet another laboratory, or excuse me, another program um, is is working with their state and trying to this the state is has a state funded simulation health sciences center mm -hmm. and this laboratory or this program is trying to get a, a laboratory um, set up in in this um, state funded simulation lab that that is being built and and I hope the pro the program director indicated they've submitted you know, their requests, I, I'm pulling for you. I hope yeah. you get that because it, it sounds like a really, a really yeah. cool thing to have access to this. And then, you know, and that will help ease the burden a little bit to, yep. um, with yep. the clinical affiliates as well and yeah. being able to have, have students in this type of simulation lab. So uh, that goes a little bit beyond the interdisciplinary end of it, but I mm -hmm. wanted to mention it because I think it's a pretty, pretty cool thing that this program is trying to do uh, with their state. So. Definitely. Right. So recruitment, um, love seeing recruitment all over the map. So we've got recruitment, recruitment within um, going uh, to colleges and universities, those within your lab, um, even at a high school level. So um, Karen, why don't you share some of the things that you found really interesting in, in the recruiting area? Well, and I think programs are, as you indicated here, and from the responses that we got, are continuing to find mm -hmm. new ways, you know, new ways to recruit. There's, there's the, the, the old um, standbys of, of um, visiting um, um, high school and grade school and junior high programs or uh, classes, um, passing out flyers, but um, it's really... Um, it, it's 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 something that programs really still need to do, and they're still finding the ways to do this. And programs are reaching out, trying to find pathways for people that already are working in the laboratory, for instance. So it's not you know just looking at um, the younger age people that aren't even in the profession yet, but looking at those that are somehow connected to healthcare 
and maybe even working in laboratories currently, but saying, okay, mm -hmm. think about this. This is something additional that you can do and working mm -hmm. with their employers to um, um, encourage current people working in their in, in their organizations to move into laboratory or to advance within the laboratory. And, um, you know, hospitals are really trying to um, um, work with individuals that already have bachelor, bachelor's degrees and help them get into specifically, whether it's getting another bachelor's degree or a certificate, mm -hmm. you know, and making them, allowing them to sit for certification. So we're seeing a lot of programs working with their employers for um, this area as well. So um, some programs are offering dual enrollment as well. So they're working with their local um, community colleges yeah. and trying to um, offer them a way to work within the laboratory. So, um, and I think, again, this is an area in which um, programs are looking to, um, when they're looking at recruitment, and I, and I think what goes along with this a little bit too, is retention. Mm -hmm. And, and um, programs I've noticed too are looking for for ways to retain students within the program. And this, again, harkens yeah. back to what I said earlier about mm -hmm. looking at um, non-academic as well as academic right. ways to support their students. So I think it's all, you know, it's all uh, intertwined in, you know, mm -hmm. it's important to recruit students, but then you also need to look at ways to retain them. And, and we see that with our programs. Yeah, and that really lends nicely into the next slide, which which gets into the career ladder because that is what a lot of today's students they're wanting once they get into the laboratory, um, they want to be able to um, advance um, or, you know, it, sometimes the recruiting and the career ladder go hand in ha hand to advertise that career ladder to try and entice students to come in. So, um, so yeah, so why don't you give us some highlights on um, some of the different ways people are um, developing career ladder Right. And again, you know, having a career lab ladder and having that available and having students know that this is available is another way to retain the students with the program. So we have, um, you know, a program that has um, um, embedded uh, a phlebotomy specimen processor technical um, uh, certificate or diploma program within um, their program to allow, and this was actually an MLT program, instituting this phlebotomy um, technical option. So a way to offer to um, individuals that may not be necessarily within their program yet, but here's something you can do. You can start out as a phlebotomist and work your way into other positions with the, the laboratory. Then programs are off offering um, a structured categorical program. So they're uh, using their existing um, uh, courses Mm -hmm. in chemistry, blood bank, hematology, micro, whatever, to mm -hmm. uh, help increase enrollment and then um, offer this to um, individuals um, working currently within the laboratory. And, um, you know, once they get to this um, point, then they can um, sit, of course, for, for cert certification exams. So um, they're... Um, also programs that are offering um, evening courses and trying to um, have the, um, in this case of an MLT program, offering their classes in the evening and trying to um, encourage individuals to move, you know, in advance within the laboratory from that. And um, they're hoping that, you know, this will help the students go on into an MLS uh, program as well. Yeah. Fantastic overview. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you, Karen. So we're moving on to the general Q&A now. In Q&A, we can uh, take any questions about what we covered today or any anything related to national standards or policies and procedures. Before we get into that, um, do want to remind everybody about our DLPs. Our DLPs are current review committee members who um, have volunteered to answer standard interpretation questions from program directors. So if you're working on your self-study or prepping for your site visit, and you have a question uh, about a specific item or, or another as it re relates to standard interpretation, um, these are the individuals you'll want to contact. 
uh, you can find these names on, and their contact information on the program directors page of NACLS.org. If you have more process related questions, like when is my self-study due, um, when are my fees due, things of that nature, that should go more towards staff. And if you don't know where, they, where that question falls, just go ahead and start with staff. Um, one quick caveat about the discipline leads. Um, they are there for very specific questions about standards. We don't try to give them um, like materials to give a preliminary review or things of that nature, like a once over my progress report or something like that. Since they are currently review committee members, that comes really uh, close to our conflict of interest. Um, so we like to steer clear of those sorts of things. So you can take Q&A through one of two ways. You can either raise your hand and we can do the audio version through the webinar, or you can type it in the Q&A chat box, which you should all, should all have access to. Oh, Pat, raise your hand. Pat, I will, I'm allowing you to talk right now and you will have to unmute in order to be heard. Pat? Yes, hi. Thanks, you guys. Those were great ideas. Um, you mentioned the um, MLT programs that move, the, the MLT to MLS programs, and I have one of these programs, or we have one of those programs here. Uh, but I have been, um, I don't, shouldn't say accused, but people mention that, well, all you're really doing is stealing the MLT population, mm -hmm. and um, you're not, you're really contributing to the total N of the laboratory professional um, population. So um, I guess uh, I my my rationale is that some of these MLTs, and I've spoken to them, um, say, well, if we weren't able to move on to an MLS, we would probably leave the lab for some other profession, go into nursing, for which we have had some, et cetera. So um, I guess I'm just, um, you know, feeling guilty a little bit, but I'm also curious what, you know, it just seems like we need to have a bigger push on MLT programs to produce more, um, more MLT graduates. Many of them want to stay as MLTs, but many of them do, do want to move on. And so um, how do we do this? I know MLT programs, at least I know here in Minnesota, they have um, higher attrition rates because, you um, students come into these programs and they can't handle the science or whatever. But uh, it seems to me we need to do um, some kind of push to get more MLTs into our programs and get them to be su successful. So there I'm wondering, <laughs> somebody have some innovations about that. Yeah. Um, do you want to respond or you want me to, Karen? Well, go ahead, Marissa, and then, then I'll make a comment too. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I don't think you should feel guilty, Pat, because um, every student is different. And some students, you know, they want to be a career MLT and they are happy as a clam in, in that position. And they don't they don't want to go to extra school or maybe it's not feasible for them to go to extra school. But some students do. Some students do want to or I guess professionals, MLT professionals do want to um you know climb that career ladder um and just like some students or graduates i guess some want to stay in the laboratory and some want to teach and some want to go to a research lab it's just you know there's plenty of room for all of us um and uh yeah karen do you have something you wanted to add well i do and and pat again um i wouldn't feel guilty and you know the other thing that's been said is that um uh, using um, providing phlebotomy certificate programs or diploma programs and so forth is robbing, you know, phlebotomists from the, you know, encourage them to go, encouraging phlebotomists to go on to MLT and beyond is reducing the ranks of phlebotomists. And that's a, a concern too. But, you know, I certainly agree with Marissa. Every student's different and they have to find, you know, what resonates with them in a profession and what they want they want to or where they want to head but i also think and, and pat you mentioned about how to you know what about getting more people in them or students in the mlt programs and i think 
you know, the, the programs that have shared their innovations with um, uh, offering phlebotomy programs as a way, you know, at least it's introducing students to to laboratory professions that they may never have known about. And yes, maybe, you know, it's, it's, it's robbing, you know, Peter to pay Paul from phlebotomy, but uh, if they go on MLT, then that's great. If they stay phlebotomy, that's, but at least they know about these professions now and can head that way. And, and, and we saw from what was shared with us in the innovations that, um, um, Programs are working with um, high schools in particular, um, trying, you know, the dual uh, 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 programs to offer phlebotomy concurrently and let students move on to MLT and beyond and working with setting up pre-laboratory youth apprenticeships um, with high schools is another um, innovation that was shared. And, um, these are all, in my mind, it's it's exposing individuals, um, students to to laboratory medicine, and that they may never even have considered otherwise. So it, yeah, it's a you know, it's a tough, it's just it's tough to do, and there's no, there's not going to be one complete answer that resolves everything. We all know that, I think, but all of these are ways at least getting people interested in laboratory medicine. So as I see it. Yeah, and, and I'll also say, Pat, that NACLS is involved in um, a lot of those. Um, we're getting more involved with like the Workforce um, Action Alliance that um, COLA has organized. And then also there's another um, consortium that has ASCP, ASCLS, the CDC, APHL, a whole bunch of laboratory organizations. And so NACLS is a part of all of those. And so trying to combine all of those brains together to tackle the workforce shortage, we are definitely on board with trying to figure out ways to increase the number of programs or increase the number of students that you're accepting or all of the above, um, just expanding the the reach that that NACLS programs has is is definitely very important to us and part of our strategic plan. Uh, I saw you unmuted again, Pat. Did you have a follow up to that? Oh, I just want to tell them I feel much better. Not as guilty. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. It's good to hear your voice, Pat. It is. Uh, that is a reminder uh that uh, i'm out of practice usually i do this when we do the dlps but um pat was a former board member so i want to take this opportunity to not only thank her for volunteering and continue to volunteer but we have a lot of volunteers currently on the call um keep an eye out on uh, the knuckles news and also the upcoming collect we have uh, a few volunteer announcements that we will be making um very very soon um also while we're waiting for q a any more Q&A, I'll put in a quick plug um, about a few CLEC items. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to register for the NACLS workshop and not pay the late fee, you need to do so before uh, February 1st. That information is on the website. Uh, the workshop before CLEC will be focused on the site visit. We'll still be touching on all parts of the process, but a really a, a separate focus on the site visit itself. So um, we will also have, for the first time, a non-credit presentation, really focused mm -hmm. on uh, NACLS volunteering. That that is part of your CLEC admission. The workshop mm -hmm. is not. So you, there are no extra fees associated for that. And that will be part of the CLEC program on their app that they're releasing. Um, we will have, as many of you who go, go to CLEC know, um, after 2020, they stopped doing the ASCP, BOC, and NACLS updates in person. They've moved those to videos, and then there's in-person Q&A. So please locate that. Um, our board president, Robert Cottrell, uh, put that, uh, presented that. I just recorded that with Robert earlier today, and there's a lot of um, salient announcements and good information uh, regarding um, upcoming projects and things on top of everybody's mind. Um, and finally, uh, NACLS will have a booth as we've had the last few years. So feel free to come say hi if you have any questions about um, anything or if you just want to say hi. Yep. And there's another surprise coming, but I'm not going to share what that is yet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, definitely follow uh, the Knackles News. And then if you are on LinkedIn, um, you uh, can follow Knackles as well, or um, I'm on there as well if, if you, uh, but I usually push everything from my personal account to the Knackles account and vice versa. So um, that's another way to, to get more information. I'm loving seeing a lot of names here that I recognize. So lots of our um, people who've been on task forces and, um, you know, I, I noticed no, new program directors and um, also review committee members, board members. Yeah. Awesome to see you all. I think we're going to end the call there. There's no more Q&A. Um, you can always reach out to Knackle staff if you remember something after this is done for any kind of follow-up. Um, other than that, um, we will be announcing the next February session soon, um, and hopefully we'll see you at CLEC.